They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. We beseech thee that we, who here do honor to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country, may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that, forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives, we may live only to thy glory, to the service of all mankind, and in the interests of peace, through Jesus Christ.
Jesus, grant unto the souls of thy servants and handmaids, the anniversary of whose death we now commemorate, a place of refreshment, the blessedness of rest, and the brightness of thine everlasting light. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end.
We pray for those members of the Guild of All Souls who have died or notice of whose deaths have been received since the last annual requiem. Mercer Dolman Martin, Marie Ford Zoom, Virgil Pratt Templeton Jr., Gerard C. Sprague, Andrew Robert Risner, priest, Pamela Ann Rowell Rettig, Robert George Preston, priest, Betty Mae Young O'Dell, Eugene F. Lefebvre, priest, Geraldine Valerie Kovach, Cale Francis King, priest, Faye Audrey Hopkins, John Carlton Hayden, priest, Aileen L. Evans, Shirley S. Dunlap, Janet Lee Cornwall, Elizabeth Starkey Charette, Jerry Lee Boatler, Teresa Frances Cosma Boer, Mary Bartas Bartsas, Benedetta Argenio, William G. Welch, Shirley Baker Morse, Elizabeth P. Hawhey, Warren Elward Schoberg, priest, the sister Mary Cyril, CSM, Francis Elaine Nelson Rosenberg, Martha F. Lynch, Robert Campbell Witcher, sometime Bishop of Long Island, on whose souls and on all the souls of the faithful departed, may Almighty God have mercy. Amen. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As we've just, in these last few minutes, made a commemoration of all those who died during the catastrophic wars of the 20th century, and indeed we remember those who have fallen in the last 22 years in this century, we have commemorated and thought about and prayed for those of the former British Empire, now the Commonwealth of Nations. And it is a solemn day of remembrance for those countries to pray for those who were in both the armed forces and, and civilians who gave their all for the cause of peace in a century of bloody and unforgiving conflict in the two world wars, primarily 1914 through 1918 and 1939 through 1945. While there have been questions regarding the First World War, why and what did it solve, almost from the beginning of that conflict, it is much easier to see the absolute necessity to defeat the evil of Nazism from perverting irrevocably the image of God in one another during the Second World War. Nonetheless, it adds a somber layer of remembrance to our observance of the Guild of All Souls Requiem today. Even as we mark, dare I say, celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Guild and its founding in the United Kingdom in 1873. Perhaps one of the greatest deceits of the Reformation period and of Protestantism in general, and there are a great many deceits, is the attitude to the dead, to death, what follows and what we can do. Of course, it's all tied in closely with the belief in the last day and the final judgment. But the cliche, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, indeed comes to mind. What may have seemed like a sincere attempt to correct vastly misunderstood ch church teaching 
on a number of fronts. The sacraments, faith and works, the merits and intercession of the saints for both the living and the faithful departed, just to name a few. What unfortunately resulted in what the sometime Bishop of South, of South Carolina, Fitzsimmons Allison, called the cruelty of heresy. Heresy is invariably cruel, and that the end results for the people of God are nothing short of catastrophic. A library of books, other than his, have been written about the ever-expanding, atrophying effects of Protestantism on the Church since the 16th century. What happens after death, as understood by Protestantism, is particularly cruel and is the main reason why this guild exists. This Protestantism, as it has been professed by the Church of England, or by portions of the Church of England, since the time of the Elizabethan settlement, has its roots in the Calvinistic Puritanism of those exiles who fled the reign of Bloody Mary, Queen Mary I, in the middle of the 1550s. We all know our history. Upon the death of her half-brother, the extremely Protestantly influenced Edward VI, the, the son of the, the third of Henry VIII's wives, Jane Seymour, Mary ascended the throne, and she restored the Roman Catholic Church to prominence and to be the church of the land, a religion, or I should say the religion, professed by her mother, Queen Catherine of Aragon, before Henry VIII's mania for a male heir led him to casting off his, first, his wife and marrying Anne Boleyn, opening up the door to what would come later, and who was, of course, the mother of the Queen, Queen Mary's half-sister, Elizabeth. With the seeming triumph or restoration of Catholicism, her cousin, Cardinal Reginald Pole, being Archbishop of Canterbury and spearheading the restoration, and in the wake of Dr. Cranmer's deposition and imprisonment and eventual death, many who had accommodated themselves to Henry's abortive, or moderate, I suppose people call, attempts to reform the church and Edward's far more radical changes. Many of them fled to the continent. Those who were, let's call them moderates, I suppose, fled to Strasbourg. And being influenced by these moderate ideas and committed to a somewhat underst Catholic understanding of the church, would eventually for a short time, gained the upper hand. The first Archbishop of Canterbury under Queen Elizabeth, Matthew Parker, was one such exile. But a far more influential group who had influenced the church for hundreds of years were those who settled in Geneva and more readily adopted the teachings, if you will, and the principles of Jean Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, and the like. A representative of that party, and let's call it that, which would soon, of course, be identified as Puritans, was John Knox. The Geneva refugees would come to have a disproportionate influence on the people throughout the 16th and into the 17th centuries. The Geneva Bible was the Bible most English speakers read, until the 1662 Book of Common Prayer adopted the authorized King James Version, and that Bible began to take the place of Geneva. But the teaching, the damage would be done. Even though many dissenters, as they were called, were deprived following the Act of Uniformity which restored the polity and prayer book of the church, in the Church of England in 1662. Nevertheless, that book and their influence was far-reaching. The Articles of Religion had been interpreted in a Calvinistic way 
despite the best efforts of later generations, to interpret them in a less rigorous light. But in particular, this influence can be felt in the burial of the dead, which encapsulated the prevailing reformed Presbyterian rejection of masses for the dead, including prayers of any kind that encouraged prayer for the dead at all. Together with the rejection, or rather the mutilation, let's call it that, of Catholic teaching on the communion of saints, the effects on the common folk of the Church of England were indeed far-reaching. One has only to look at the burial of the dead to see how little comfort and hope are provided by that office. We may be charmed by the lovely language and settings of the sentences, the opening sentences, which open that service, and two particularly fine ones are by Henry Purcell and William Croft. But it does little to encourage an active participation among the living to do something for the departed. It was indeed during the Great War and its aftermath that this deficit, this deficiency, became readily apparent. How, how do we deal with the millions of dead? How do we deal with the flower of a generation being cut off? And anyone who has visited Britain and the Commonwealth, countries of the Commonwealth, of the Empire, the former Empire, will see in every town and village some sort of memorial and names inscribed on those memorials of that flower of the generation who lost, who gave their lives in the cause of peace. And if we wander into our churches, into the established church, or into churches in the, in, the empire, in the former empire, the Anglican church, you will often find a memorial to those who gave their lives, first in the Great War, and then in the Second World War. Even in this country, there are memorials and cenotaphs, what we call cenotaphs, to the dead of that great war. The trauma was far reaching and indeed made its way down to our own day as wars continued, lives continued to be lost in conflict and we searched as a, as a society for a way in which to cope. Ordinary Protestantism, ordinary expressions of the Church of England no longer provided any kind of comfort. And we no longer had those maudlin Victorian practices such as photographing the departed in their living rooms, the elaborate procession with open, with carriages that revealed the coffin inside, and horses with great black feathered headpieces. These were no longer a comfort to anyone. And so it was that following the war, expressions and outpourings of grief and, yes, providing comfort were provided in those services at the many cenotaphs and, indeed, the one that is going on and will go on for Remembrance Sunday, both in London and other places throughout the world. It was this outpouring, this devastation, this search for comfort that led to the revision of some services in the prayer book. 
particularly in the failed revisions of 1927 and 1928, but which we ourselves in the many provinces would adopt. But for many, there was already a way, a way to ensure comfort for the soul and prayer for those who had died. And it was and is found in the guild. In 1873, a group of laymen established this guild, this purgatorial society, founded on the principles of the Catholic faith, with the Requiem Mass at the center of our life as a guild. We came and we, we understood and were able to continue to teach that this world, this portion of the church is but the smallest of the great church of God. The church on the move, the church militant is but the smallest portion of the universal church. Far greater size, of course, is the church triumphant, the saints and angels, the saints of God, known to us and unknown, encouraging us on our way, praying for us that we too might join them where they are. And the church expectant. The guild taught the true meaning of the communion of saints that when we leave this earthly life, this earthly journey, those who are here and not yet in that portion of the church are nonetheless tied intimately with those who have gone before. They are not dead, not as the world understands death. And it has been the Guild's mission, the Guild's reason, to remind the Church of this truth, that we are in an intimate communion of saints, the living, those departed, and those in the kingdom of God, or who see the vision glorious that we all share the living bond that is found through Christ. That we share in bonds formed and sustained by love. Because what we do here today and at every Requiem Mass, whether it is of remembrance on Remembrance Sunday, an individual or all the faithful departed what we do is an unselfish act, an act of love. We get no benefit. It is all for those who have gone before us, who rest and repose in that place where there is no sorrow nor crying, in that place where they grow in service where the slings and arrows and bruises of this life are healed and transfigured. They benefit from our prayers, our prayers like love letters, cards of, cards of remembrance, cards of love and they are comforted by this as they themselves advance more and more toward that perfect glory of course we can't say we know this absolutely for certain 
but it is part of the communion of saints. It makes perfect sense. And when it is our time, God willing, we shall know even as we are known. The Guild of All Souls is a guild primarily of love. Love for those who have gone before us in the communion of saints, the church of the in, in glory, the church at rest, the church here, still walking in her path, on her path, under orders. The Guild has shown for 150 years that death is not the end. Death is not a period. It is but a comma. And that after this life, so much more is to come. And that we have our part to play in that great destiny and story. Martha said to Jesus, I know if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knew and loved her brother. And it encapsulates for us those words that our Lord himself spoke. I am the resurrection and the life. here in the Guild, and with our Masses, our prayers, our daily prayers, as we pray the Chantry day in, day out, it is brought forcefully home to us that we do have our role to play, that death does not take those we know beyond our care. It is not out of sight, out, out of mind. And that we can enfold them through our prayers, through our masses offered, in the love and comfort of their Redeemer, knowing that we send love and care to them. 150 years is not a long time. But how many souls have received the love of our prayers and care in that time? There is still a need for us to teach our brothers and sisters in the church. that in the communion of saints, life is found, life everlasting. And that we, through our prayers, give comfort to the dead, so that when it is our turn to cross that boundary from this world into the next, there will be others who send us love, love, love letters through their prayers, that we may all be joined together, the saints, the departed, and the living, in love, in joy, in felicity.
It is a very neat right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O God, Holy Father, almighty everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom hath shone forth unto us the hope of a blessed resurrection, that they who bewail the certain condition of their mortality may be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. For the life of thy faithful people, O Lord, is changed, not taken away, and hath the dissolution of the tabernacle of this earthly sojourning, a dwelling place eternal, is made ready in the heavens. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Sancta, 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 Sancta.
the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, would that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others, who shall be partakers of this holy communion, may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Remember also, O Lord, thy servants and handmaids, who have gone before us sealed with the seal of faith, and who sleep the sleep of peace. To them, O Lord, and to all that rest in Christ, we beseech thee to grant the abode of refreshing, of light, and of peace. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven,
beseech thee, almighty and merciful God, that the souls of thy servants and handmaids, for whom we have offered unto thy majesty the sacrifice of praise, may through the power of this sacrament be cleansed from all their sins, and by thy mercy obtain the blessedness of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Requiescent in pace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The beginning of the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory be to you, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. 